ओम भूर्भुवः स्वत सवितुरवरेण्यं भर्गो देवश्च धीमहि धियो यो नः प्रचोदयात् ओम शान्ति 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 नमस्कार माय डियर फ्रेंड्स आई एम स्टार्टिंग वीडियोस ऑन कथा उपनिषद और कठोपनिषद This is one of the eleven most important Upanishads. The Katha Upanishad is widely read both in the East and in the West. The knowledge of the Self is here described in a lucid style almost unparalleled in the philosophical writings of the world. Max Muller has said that the French, German and English translators of the Upanishads regard this treatise as one of the most perfect specimens of the mystic philosophy and poetry of the ancient Hindus. The Upanishads form for the most part the concluding portions of the Brahmana sections of the Vedas. But the exact relationship of the Katha Upanishad to the Vedas is a controversial subject, some associating with the Shama Veda, some with the Yajur Veda, and others with the Athar Veda. The Brahmanas of the Tatiriya Yajur Veda contains a story of Nachiketa very similar to the one found in the Katha Upanishad. So, this, this, this type of controversies, they are not important. We should emphasize what is contained, what is the gist of the Upanishad. So, these controversies we need not worry about. Like all the Upanishads, the Katha Upanishad aims at inculcating the knowledge of Brahma, which alone, according to Vedanta, enables a man to attain immortality and freedom. As the subject is profound and difficult to grasp, the Upanishad following an ancient Hindu method begins with an illustrative tale. There once lived a Rishi named Vajasarvasa who performed a sacrifice that required, among other things, the giving away by the sacrificer of all his wealth. He had a son, he had a son named Nachiketa, who, though young, cherished a reverence for spiritual things. When the cows were brought for distribution among the Brahmins and priests, who were to conduct the sacrifice, Nachiketa found them to be old and unfit for any use. Such an unworthy gift, the boy realized, would only bring misery to his father after death. And so, since he was eager to save his father from this impending calamity, he said to him that his son was also property and should be included among the things for distribution. He wished to know, therefore, to whom he was going to be given. Three times he asked the question, but Vajasravasa, who was only annoyed by what he regarded as impudence on the part of his son, and he answered angrily that he would give him to Yama, the king of death. Nachiketa obeyed his father and proceeded to the abode of Yama, the latter as the arbiter of man's final destiny and the bestower of punishments and rewards held a high position among the gods. He was reputed, moreover, to be a teacher of the knowledge of Burma. Yama was away when 
Nachiketa arrived and only returned after three days. He sought to make amends for not having been there to receive his worthy guest and for any discourtesy that might have been shown to him during his absence by allowing him three bones, one for each night. Nachiketa asked as the first boon the allaying both of his father's anger and of his anxiety on account of his son's absence from home. As the second boon, he desired to know the fire sacrifice by which one goes to Brahmaloka, the plane of Brahma and enjoys, enjoys there a long life of felicity, free from disease and old age, sorrow and fear. Both boons were granted. Then, with the asking of the third boon, the teachings of the Upanishad begin. Nachiketa wished to know whether or not there was an immortal substance in a man that survived the death of the body. He asked, in other words, for the most treasured secret of the Indo-Aryan wisdom, the secret of Atma, its nature, its origin, and its destiny. A teacher, however, must first test the fitness of his pupil before instructing him in the secret of Atma. If the latter is to assimilate this knowledge, he must have cultivated keen discrimination utter detachment, a sincere longing for truth and a tranquil mind. He must have renounced all desire for the perishable pleasures both of earth and of heaven. Therefore, Yama offered Nachiketa various temptations, both earthly and celestial, such as sons, grandsons, wealth, cattle, world empire, long life, and heavenly damsels and music. The young aspirant, endowed with a sharp intelligence and calm mind, discarded them all since he knew them, belonging as they did to the mortal order of things to be impermanent since he was a seeker of immortality. He persisted in his determination to pierce the veil that hides self-knowledge and Yama granted him his desired boon. Yama taught that the self in man is none other than the spirit behind the universe which is described in the Vedas through the sacred symbol Om. The knowing self is not born, it does not die. It has not sprung from anything, nothing has sprung, sprung from it, birthless, eternal, everlasting and ancient. It is not killed when the body is killed. If the killer thinks he kills and if the kill, killed man thinks he is killed, neither of these apprehends a right. The self kills not, nor is it killed. Atma, the Self, is all-pervading consciousness and the inner core <coughs> of all things, great and small. Though dwelling in the body, it is bodiless. Though associated with changing things, it is unchanging. One cannot know Atma either by means of much study or through a keen intellect, when the mind becomes pure through devotion and righteous action, through self-control and contemplation, it then becomes serene and reflects the majesty of Atma. Yama, continuing, said that, Control of the mind and senses and not their repression is the most effective spiritual discipline for a man in the attainment of his spiritual goal.
the teacher gave the vivid illustration of a chariot which can take the rider to his destination only when it is well built and when the driver endowed with discrimination restrains the impetuous horses by means of strong reins and guides them along the designated roads likewise the body must be healthy the intellect free from uncertainty should control by means of a strong will the naturally turbulent sense organs and allow them to enjoy only those objects that are conductive to spiritual progress further through meditation the aspirant must acquire inwardness of mind and maintain an unwavering determination that will hold him to his journey till the goal is reached for the path is sharp as the as of a razor atma dwells in the hearts of all and is a man's in most essence it animates his physical vital and mental activities it is the unaltered witness of his experiences during waking dreaming and deep sleep though appearing to be identified with the functions of the body and the mind it is transcendental the attributes of the body do not cling to atma just as water does not cling to a lotus leaf the knowledge of the deathless atma which nachiketa wished to acquire from yama is itself immortality immortal immortality is not produced by this knowledge anything that is produced has a beginning and an end and cannot be immortal the self always exists undimmed and undiminished neither waxing nor waning through a man's good or bad actions like the sun however it can be hidden by the cloud of ignorance and is revealed when the ignorance is destroyed by knowledge an illumined person endowed with self knowledge attains deathlessness though he may assume or discard a body at will like a man putting on a garment or taking it off self knowledge bestows liberation from the suffering of phenomenal existence when a mortal renounces finite desires which are created by ignorance and are alien to his self he realizes immortality in this very life others remain victims of birth and death in the world of untruth therefore any one desiring freedom and immortality should separate the immortal self from the mortal body with the help of a steady and vigilant mind it is reiterated by vedantic teachers that the truth of atma is revealed when a qualified aspirant instructed by an illumined teacher practices the disciplines of the self control meditation and inwardness of mind sri sankracharya's introduction om salutation to the supreme lord salutation to yama the king of death the son of this was one the teacher of the knowledge of brahma salutation to nachiketa we propose to give a brief commentary on the following chapters comprising the katha upanishad for the easy comprehension of their import the word upanishad is found by adding the suffix ke vip and the prefix upa and ni to the verbal root sad which means to loosen to destroy and to attain the word denotes the knowledge of the 
entity Brahma sought to be established by the book we are about to explain. By what etymological process does the word Upanishad signify that knowledge? We reply, this knowledge is called Upanishad because it shatters, kills and destroys avidya or ignorance, the seed of sansara in those seekers after liberation who having lost all thirst for objects seen and heard of approach upa the knowledge is the knowledge designated as upanishad to be explained presently and cultivated with utter ni firmness and devotion as will be stated in this upanishad having realized atma one is freed from the jaws of death or the knowledge of Brahma, Brahma Vidya is termed Upanishad because it is a means to the attainment of Brahma. It enables seekers of liberation who are endowed with the above mentioned dispassion to attain the Supreme Brahma as will be stated later having received a this wisdom, Nachiketa, became free from impurities and death. Or lastly, the knowledge of fire, Agni Vidya, is called Upanishad because the verbal root Sad also means to loosen. The knowledge of fire, the firstborn and omniscient offspring of Burma, the knowledge that was sought by Nachiketa as his second boon leads to the attainment of heaven and thereby loosens the possibility of such misery as repeated dwelling in a warm birth and old age which one experiences in other planes of existence. As will be stated later, the inhabitants of heaven attain immortality. The objection may be raised that students apply the word Upanishad even to the book. One hears such statements as we study the Upanishad and we teach the Upanishad. In answer, it may be said that there is no fault in such use of the word. The meaning of the verbal root Sad as has already been stated is the destruction of the avidya, the cause of sansara. This is possible only through knowledge and not merely through a book. But the book also serves the same purpose, namely the establishment of the knowledge of Burma. It is therefore properly designated by this name. For instance, one use uses such an expression as the clarified butter is verily life. Therefore, the word Upanishad means primarily knowledge and secondarily the book. By this etymological interpretation of the Upanishad are stated the qualifications of those who are competent for knowledge. The subject matter of the Upanishad is Supreme Brahma, the inmost self of all. The purpose served by the Upanishad is the attainment of Brahma, which brings about the complete cessation of sansara. This purpose also indicates the relationship between the book and its subject matter. The former is the explainer and the latter is the thing explained. The following chapters reveal as clearly as an apple lying in one's hand. For the attainment of the knowledge of knowledge described in the Upanishad, certain qualifications are necessary. The following are the four qualifications which, which, with which a student of Vedanta must be endowed when approaching a teacher for instruction in the knowledge of Brahma. A. Discrimination Viveka between the real and the unreal. B. Renunciation Vairagyam of the unreal. 
सी ए ग्रुप ऑफ सिक्स वर्च्यूज नेमली कामनेस ऑफ माइंड समा विदड्रॉल ऑफ द सेंस ऑर्गन्स फ्रॉम देयर ऑब्जेक्ट्स दमा कीपिंग द माइंड अनडिस्टर्ब्ड बाय एक्सटर्नल ऑब्जेक्ट्स ऊपर दी पेशेंट बेरिंग ऑफ ऑल अफ्लिक्शंस तितिक्षा फेथ इन द वर्ड्स ऑफ द टीचर श्रद्धा एंड सेल्फ सेटल्डनेस और अनसीजिंग ऑफ कंसंट्रेशन ऑफ द माइंड ऑन ब्रह्मा समाधाना एंड डी लॉन्गिंग फॉर फ्रीडम मुमुक्षुता द नॉलेज कंसर्निंग द कंपिटेंसी ऑफ स्टूडेंट्स द सब्जेक्ट मैटर द पर्पस एंड द रिलेशनशिप now we shall proceed to explain the book to the best of our understanding the interest of a pupil in studying a scripture is stimulated if he is informed of the subject matter the precise relationship of the book to the subject matter and the purpose served by its study therefore a scripture discusses these points at the very outset to these writers on vedanta add a fourth point namely the qualifications of a competent pupil these are the four indispensable factors treated of in all authoritative vedantic treatises sans sankracharya mentions them in his introduction in order to demonstrate that the katha upanishad is a proper treatise on the vedanta philosophy invocation om me brahma protect us both me brahma bestow upon us both the fruit of knowledge may we both obtain the energy to acquire knowledge may what we both study reveal the truth may we cherish no ill feeling towards each other om peace 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 protect by revealing the true nature of knowledge both the perceptor and the disciple ill feeling etc owing to unclear instruction on the part of the perceptor or imperfect understanding on the part of the disciple the idea is may there be no ill feeling between us on account of any mistake committed by the one or the other through carelessness or for some other reason peace the word is thrice repeated in order to remove the three possible obstacles that both the teacher and the disciple may meet with namely physical illness natural calamity and injury from harmful animal the supreme lord is invoked at the common commencement and the termination of the study of the vedas and other scriptures for the removal of all faults committed intentionally unintentionally carelessly or through excitement oversight or non observance of the proper rules so this was all the introductory part of this upanishad so i end this video here next video will start first chapter of the katha upanishad thank you for watching this video namaste my dear friends